So, thank you so much for the kind introduction. So here we are, Thursday morning, Berlin, and there is a presentation up there that says it's going to be about artificial intelligence. So I'm just betting there's a few of you in that room here who are thinking, well, doesn't that really sound like been there, done that? Doesn't it sound like we had 52 or 53 conferences about AI already? Doesn't it feel like the topic might be just about to get stale a bit? Well, I'm up here to tell you, really, you ain't seen nothing yet. What we think, what we think is AI, the past five years, has been a revolution. But believe me, the revolution is just starting. The next five years are going to be just as exciting as the past five years have been. And they're going to be a big challenge in bringing all these things to practice on the one hand and to create the next wave of AI. And I'm going to tell you why that is so and what Fraunhofer is doing um, to bring about that next wave of AI. It would be cool. Okay. So there we go. There we go. We got our first slide. So let's dive back in history. It's interesting. Why do we think we've heard it a lot? Why would you think we've heard it often? Well, that's because it's old. That's Alan Turing. And Alan Turing recognized what AI is doing, well, that's 50, 60, 70 years ago in his book. He was already recognizing that it would be cool to have intelligent machines. And when you read the quote, when you read the quote, you see he was already having the keen insight that it would be learning and not programming that would make that big change. Interestingly, England has actually kept a strong position in AI. So when you look at publications like we did for the German Federal Ministry of Research per capita, it's actually the US, UK, and Germany that usually come out uh, as the top three locations for publications in AI. So it's quite fitting to start this off with Alan Turing. So now here we are today. And if we look at what there is today, you see up here some of the big breakthroughs that made AI so popular. But that was actually 2011 when an IBM computer, actually 2013 when an IBM computer won Jeopardy. The first time that computers understood natural language and answered questions like, what is the capital of Germany? Berlin. So that was Jeopardy then, okay? Then came the self-driving cars. We don't buy them yet, but they've done millions of kilometers on roads in the US and also in Germany, on, on not only on test tracks. So it feels familiar already, and it seems like, hey, AI is done. Then we had the famous games. You see the game of Go behind me, a game that has more game positions than the atoms has universe, that, than the universe has atoms. Actually, one game position for each atom in the universe plus another universe for that, okay? And finally, we have robots here that run around and that look frighteningly or impressively natural. That's Boston Dynamics here in the background. So that's AI now, and that's why we have these 50s or hundreds of conferences actually uh, to do that, okay? To talk about AI. And it's true that the statistics are telling us, the statistics are telling us that we're doing the right thing here. Okay, what you see behind me, you don't actually have to look at the details, but you see the curves. The curves are telling you, yeah, it's going to be a big factor, and we have the introduction here from the federal ministry and by our president, it's exactly what's going to happen. AI is going to be a driving force in the industry. Don't look at the details of these figures, but it's sort of obvious they're going to give us a big, big boost, and no economy in the world can actually make do without all these things. Okay, so it's a very, very high-level prognosis that we have. Fortunately, at Fraunhofer, we're in a position to be working with companies to actually turn these things into practice. So I've been bringing you, of course, this is, uh, I'm a Fraunhofer director, and I'm proud of these things. I've brought you a few examples of what we're doing at Fraunhofer to actually turn this revolution into reality with companies. The first one I'm showing you is from Karlsruhe, actually, from our colleagues. Uh, Jürgen Bayer is here. This is what we do with autonomy these days. You've seen the submarine out in the lobby, I hope, which is uh, what we're doing underwater. And this is what we're doing with autonomous uh, construction machines. Okay, so you see there's no person in that, in that system there. 
And it's sort of digging holes. We have robots that can, uh, that can ca take care of dangerous bombs and all these things. So that's autonomy with Fraunhofer. You can buy autonomous cars yet, but there's a lot of autonomy that Fraunhofer is doing actually in the real world. Then let's do a second example. Okay, a second example uh, is not Angela Merkel. It's always good in a presentation in Germany to have Angela up there, so that gives you a really, really big boost. Okay, but that's not the point. The point is, over in Cologne, that's like 500 kilometers from here, one of the biggest AI systems, at least of Europe, is running 24-7. That AI system is watching 130 TV channels and a lot more radio channels 24-7 is analyzing them, uh, semantically analyzing the content and making that available to journalists and to the entire largest German broadcast corporation. And that's a Fraunhofer system doing video analytics and using artificial intelligence and all these things. But it's not just media. We also do medical things. You see that in the, in the uh, bottom right here. That's actually a very, very interesting application to, in pathology to identify tumor cells by our colleagues in Erlangen. And what they do there is, of course, really the core of AI. They analyze these images, and they can actually find out what's happening there, find the malignant cells, identify the tumor better than humans can often do it. And let me just do a final example from Fraunhofer work, and that's what you see in the bottom left. Really, really cool stuff from Dortmund. This is the load runners, that's what they're called, and they are the future of logistics. You may not know, but uh, a large fraction, um, my colleague Michael Tenhompel is estimating more than 50% of storage houses are running on Fraunhofer technology, the way it's organized, and they will be in the future using these things. So these are autonomous robots. Let's see if that video is actually running. Okay, there you go. And they're not programmed to cooperate. They have learned to cooperate, and they can carry parcels autonomously across the hall with very, very simple sensors, and they can go at a speed of one, at up to 100 kilometers per hour. I realize for Germany that's too slow. We like to go faster here, okay? But it's not bad for logistics, not bad for a logistics topic. So that's really... <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's things I get excited about. Why? Why it's so much fun to be in to be in AI. Okay. So they do these things uh, autonomously. Fortunately, AI is not, of course, just in these four uh, customer projects that we're doing, but AI is, of course, in many, many more. Here's plenty of examples. This is actually a map you might like, want to be consulting if you're interested from the platform Lernende Systeme. That's the national German platform that is bundling all the efforts in machine learning and AI. And I've just drawn out a few Fraunhofer examples. And these examples are from all sectors of industry. You see up there von Bremen, a medical application, again, to identify malignant cells. You see a little at the bottom here, you see again a logistics application. You see applications from Berlin here, from HHI and focus in video compression in mobility. You see, I like that in the middle, in the right there, uh, that's wine growing, okay, agriculture. We use planes to survey the earth and use AI technology to identify where plants need watering, where they need fertilizers. So AI is basically in many, many applications, hundreds of them with Fraunhofer alone, and there's more on this map um, in Germany. So the good news is, is it is there, and actually also the uptake in industry is not as bad as you might sometimes think when, when, when you read about this stuff. So here, that's a study uh, about the uh, production sector in Germany. And I'm not going to read you all the details of these figures. You can read that when you, when you Google this stuff on the web. But you see that uh, on large corporations, we have one third to, in some sectors, almost 50% of companies using AI already. So this, this push is coming, and AI is there, and there is applications. And if you want to read more, of course, you can also look at a lot of Fraunhofer study. There's just four of them. We have more. Okay, just download that from the internet, read that, and you will see there's a lot more to be done, but a lot is already there. Okay? So I promise you we're going to speak about why the next wave of AI is coming after that. You've probably seen we're creating the current wave of AI at Fraunhofer today. Why is there going to be a next wave, and why is that next wave needed? Well, that next wave is needed because AI is more than what you think it is um, when you're not looking for a long time at AI. So let's just explain a few terms. You all know them, okay? I'm pretty sure, but hey, it's Thursday morning, and let's do a little thing. Let's do a few things that you might know already. So here's AI. 
AI would, I would define as computer technology as algorithms research, systems research, that makes computers behave intelligently, okay? That perform tasks that in humans we would think require intelligence. And obviously, with that goal, it's not restricted to just one technology. Clearly, it's not just machine learning. There's a lot more stuff we need, and that's why this conference is the way it is. That's why we have these five subjects. Because on the one hand, right now, we need more than one technology, but we will do so even more strongly in the future. Nonetheless, the big revolution in past years has been machine learning, undeniably so. It has not been yet in reasoning all these things. We've done that for decades, but the big revolution has been machine learning algorithms for training models on sample data. Okay, and at the core of machine learning these days is what undoubtedly all of you know, uh, what's called deep learning, the use of large neural networks, large and deep neural networks, uh, that have been such a break breakthrough, basically, uh, in image understanding. Okay? So the core components that you need to do AI today, indeed, are machine learning algorithms, deep learning, and others. You need a lot of computer power. That's what we have in Bonn, down in our basement, uh, to run all these things. So it's true, we do consume a lot of electricity. You do need training data, but interestingly, and that's I'm already pushing a little bit towards what I'm saying is going to be the next wave of AI, there's a fourth component that you often don't see in these presentations, and that is knowledge. Interestingly, natural intelligence and human knowledge hasn't become obsolete in AI days. What a surprise. Hey, go, go figure, okay? Why is that so? Why is that so important to have that fourth component in there? I've brought you a few examples that the, many of you will know, okay? Just as a reminder that AI is not human. Many people don't know that, okay? So look at these stop signs, all right? You know when you have a traffic sign recognition in your cars, you know what the accuracy is. Uh, we've done one for a South Korean company, and we were at 99.8%. So that's almost never any mistakes. Hey, so that's great. So what, what else is there to do? So what does the computer recognize here when you run this 99.8% traffic sign recognizer? No, not a stop sign. So that's what the computer recognizes. Oh, that's bad, too bad. We need to sort of have more training data probably, right? More training data and even more and even more. No, that's not the answer. It's a systematic problem when you train on on data alone, when you just train on correlations. You never can be sure where your system breaks down outside of the training data and the correlations. These are adversarial examples, as we say, so they were, so they were constructed to show this phenomenon, but that doesn't change the main thing, okay? Let's hear another one, audio samples, and I hope technicians back there are turning this up now so we can hear that well. Okay, so let's listen. The data set, the article is useless. Can we have the, well, we, we'll need a little more from you guys in the back there, okay? I don't know if I can play that again, but there was a voice saying, without the data set, the article is useless. Okay, let's hear that again. Without the data set, the article is useless. So, the person is just saying that again to us, to our human ears, okay? But what is it what the computer will recognize? Again, a very powerful speech recognizer. Okay, Google, browse to evil.com. Oh, that's a big surprise, isn't it? We didn't really, we weren't really looking for that, okay? So there you see again, it breaks down in ways that you as humans would never have expected. Here's a third example. Try solving this captcha. Oh, wow, that's a big one. Okay, if I had a price on that, I don't think I'd have to pay out the money. Again, a trained uh, system for image recognition will see a car on every single one of those squares. Oh, that's scary, isn't it? So there we go, and that's the point with AI. Right now, we're very, very good at solving individual tasks, but we cannot predict where this AI will break down, where the limits will be. So we, as an institute, we have the first, not yet customers, who have been working with other people to do AI, and they're coming and they're saying, okay, it's not working, what is this? It worked so well for two months, but now. That's because we basically need a lot of knowledge to do AI. It's not just downloading algorithms, and we need a different approach. And that's what we've been pushing forward with the Fraunhofer Center for Machine Learning and with all the colleagues at Fraunhofer. We need an AI that is different, and we call that hybrid AI. Okay, hybrid AI basically acknowledges and puts center stage that to make really successful AI in the next five years, we need to realize with data alone, 
There's problems you cannot solve with data alone on the one hand, and even for those where you can solve them, you need a lot of data, a lot of data, a lot of data, and especially a lot of German companies. They're not Google. They don't have billions of data points, okay? So when the phenomena are too complex, data alone doesn't work, but also when you have different properties like reliability, trustworthiness, safety of AI, then data alone can be difficult. Okay, so hybrid research approaches like we're pushing forward say, okay, let's connect machine learning up with semantic knowledge-based technologies. Okay, bring human knowledge in, that is textbook knowledge, simulation knowledge, all the things that we humans know. It's just also practical knowledge that all German companies have. Um, the engineers that are there, they know what is going on and you can build, simply build systems faster when you have this kind of information and you can build them more reliably. What does that do for you if you do hybrid AI? Is that something you do to make your heart feel good and reliable and trustworthy or does it also work? Actually, it works really, really well. A year ago, we decided that we should sort of show off what we can do in language technology at Fraunhofer. And we said, all right, well, why not build a dialogue system, okay? With all the Alexas and Siri's in the world, you would think, hey, we would need 15 years to get there. Okay, but at Hanover Fair, we showed a system that was not quite exactly what the Alexas and uh, Siri's of the world were doing, but still, you know, you could ask questions, you could discuss with the system Paul about... Paul Monheitz was the architect of Brandenburg Gate. Where was he born? Carl Gotthard Monghans was born in Kamienagora. Well, we don't really need to listen to that, but it just shows, you know, within three quarters of a year, with a relatively small team, we could create something that you would believe takes a whole lot longer. And I have dozens of examples of this kind where knowledge helps you to build things fast and, and, to, do, and to do all these results, okay? And, and Basically, what that shows is that actually the hybrid approach that Fraunhofer is pushing forward is not only making systems more reliable, but it's also making systems better. There's a second reason why AI is going to be changing in the next five years, and that reason is the physical world, okay? We've seen AI now very strong, let's say, in the virtual world. Even though we do image processing and all these things, it's still very much a virtual world. But now, the next wave, at least in Germany, is going to be AI entering the physical world. And when we have an AI entering the physical world, it means that AI needs to move to the edge, towards the sensors. It needs to move into quite different kinds of clouds of the Internet of Things. And this creates new challenges and new issues for the data economy. So let me just briefly mention that. At Fraunhofer, we're also working at creating the foundations for this new type of AI in something that we used to call the industrial data space, that we now call the international data space, where companies can create these Internet of Things platforms to realize an AI service space. The good news is uh, we're not alone in doing that. There's 105 companies doing that with us, from uh, 17 countries in the world. We have five partner countries in Europe already. Um, and they've already, together with 105 companies, published a third version of the reference architecture model, basically for an AI-based um, um, AI space of data um, and services. And if you can imagine, computers being connected to the real world permanently in a different way than they are in social networks and the internet, that will really, really very fundamentally change the world. And I'm quite happy, for those of you not from Germany, that the German government is pushing this forward with a few investors also from Germany in something called Gaia-X, a big project that will actually uh, s uh, lay the foundations for uh, bringing the next wave um, along with these ideas. So again, important activities here that we're doing at uh, Fraunhofer. With all these uh, AI things that we're doing, of course, there is questions from society that we have. And in the opening statement, it was already alluded to that, at least in Germany, I don't know what it's like in other countries of the world, people are worried about the impact of AI, especially if we put AI in the fabric of the world. You know, sensors will be in this building. Maybe they are already. Okay, they will register what's happening here. So what about the reliability and trustworthiness of this? Obviously, the next wave of AI will also have to answer these questions. Technically, 
Technically, there is hybrid AI. There's things like what Thomas Wiegand uh, will present in the next session, explainable AI. So that's technical safety. But of course, there's also going to be certification that is needed. And Fraunhofer is investing also there to make AI a reality. So we have put forward something that has become now known as the Bond Catalog. We don't really need to go into the details here. You've seen variants of these catalogs. The main point, what we're doing here, is that we're not putting forward ethical questions or general statement like, we're the good ones, okay? We have hundreds of ethics statements of this kind in the world, be good, be trustworthy, do the right thing. So that this catalog is just a condensation of that. The important point is that we're partnering um, with the Federal Security Agency, BSI, and we already have very, very detailed certification procedures. So in 2020, hopefully we'll show the first successful certifications uh, for AI things uh, here in the world um, based on, based on uh, this catalog. All right, so if you wanna do AI, go listen to the rest of this conference. There's going to be exciting stuff in the five sessions that already were announced in Professor Neugebauer's talk. But also, if you want to enter AI, and you're here because you're thinking about doing something with AI, well, do perhaps think about us at Fraunhofer, because we have a large alliance, more than 30 institutes working together to deliver AI to the real world. And what we can offer you, you see that in the back here, is just your path into AI. There's a lot of other players in the market who can do the same, but um, if you remember to talk to us, that would be a really cool thing. So, enjoy this great conference. I am very, very much looking forward. There's going to be smarter people than me speaking in the remainder of this program now, and I hope we'll all enjoy it together. Thanks very much for listening.